This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Use the promo code LASTAPRIL and get a droplet for free for two months and buy Ting. Go to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device. Welcome to Linux Action Show, Season 31, Episode 8, a.k.a. Episode 308. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey, Matt. Good morning to you. Good morning. Are you ready for me to tell folks about the big show today? Oh, let's do it. All right. Well, coming up on this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, is the Intel NUC a Mac Mini killer? Can a computer that fits in the palm of your hand actually provide a no-compromises desktop computing experience? Well, spoiler alert, the answer is no. There are a few caveats. We'll tell you about those, but I loaded up GNOME 320. 12 on this with Arch Linux, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, I'll tell you what, I walked away pretty impressed, so we'll give our uh, review of the Intel NUC as a desktop Linux computer, what you need to know, what you need to kind of think about, and what the advantages are. Plus, in the news segment, we're going to talk about an awesome new space game coming to Linux that people are mm-hmm. really excited about, and in the feedback segment, if you're looking to up your Linux skill set, get some certifications, maybe become trained on AWS, we have got a great resource for you. Something maybe to make you a little more employable, too. So stay tuned for the feedback nice. segment. And in the feedback segment, I'm going to give everybody an update on our Linux Fest Northwest yeah. 2014 plans. If you are a sharp-eyed viewer watching the video version, you might see one of the hints right now. Oh, yes. And then, of course, we've got a few other things in the news segment. But first, Matt, it is our picks. Ish. This pick this week blows my mind. Now, I don't want you to sit here and feel like your life has been a waste. But I'm going to warn you, <laughs> this might make <laughs> okay, you feel like gonna that. Okay, it's going to basically poo-poo my whole existence. Yes, All yes. Right. Uh, this Morse code flashing Enigma, Enigma, Enigma style, see, I can't even say it, Enigma wow. style encryption box runs Linux. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, you got me in the uh, So this, uh, 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 this, guy, this kid, he's uh, in middle school, uh, Michael uh, Lizitz, I think is his name, he made a Enigma encryption. Remember, remember yeah, the I was Enigma say, World, War II, World War II German yeah. code, I believe? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this mm-hmm. was for a Maker Fair project. He said, the idea came to me when Google dedicated a doodle to Alan Turing. Mm-hmm. Reading on Wikipedia his story, I've learned about the Enigma machine, the project that was initially realized to be presented as a final project at a middle school, junior high, seventh grade project. Mm-hmm. So um, here's Here's what he does, and this is kind of unbelievable. And before I get into the details of how this work works, because um, I got a little video to demonstrate it, because it'll the video just just does a lot better job than I could. Here's what he had to say about using Linux. He says, and I use Linux for everything I do with my computer, and I'm very grateful to the open source community and to the Arduino community for making available online for free a huge amount of documentation. I believe that it is important to share your ideas freely and for free so that others like me can learn and so that opportun- and learn and make opportunities to know, learn, and make that do not remain available only to those who can spend more. I know that so far I have only contributed in a minimal part to the open source community, but I'm just at the beginning. Kind of awesome. So here's what he's done. Uh, It's pretty intense. So for a science project, he he reassembled in software, essentially, the Enigma machine here. And uh, if you watch, what he's got... So he's showing you the parallel here. Mm -hmm. So he's got LED... uh, display outputs. He's put it all on this piece of plexiglass, so it's all displayable. You can see the individual parts. Now, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit for you. These are the rotor switches for the Enigma device right here. How old is this kid? Seventh grade, Uh, right? Seventh grade, yeah. Good grief. I know. So these are the equivalent to these rotor devices on the old Enigma. Now you're like, okay, this is, br- and even like a good wiring job. Like, mm-hmm. look at that. Even yeah, like, no, I mean, he has proper cable management going yeah. on in there. It's not bad uh, at all. And all of these are plugging into a Linux box, and he has this keyboard right here. And you're like, okay, what's he do with this keyboard? This keyboard is where he types in the message. So he has a sender and a receiver because you have to, you know, what's the point of having an Enigma if you can't communicate exactly. with anybody, sure. right? Sure. And uh, so there's the Arduino board. Now, uh, I want to make sure I catch this part because the way he transmits messages between the devices is kind of amazing. Watch this. So here he's now. He fires it off. It, one machine uses what? Morse code light flashing to transmit SOS to the other machine. Oh now, this God. is in clear text right now. Okay. So now he's able to use these rotors to flip on the Enigma encryption. So he turns on the encryption right there. 
Now he starts to retransmit the code again Mm -hmm. to the receiving machine. But if the receiving machine doesn't have its rotors in the right position, it can't properly decode the message. Okay, okay. Now think about this like in zombie survival mode, when the people have to build encrypted communications for themselves. This is how we're going to do it. Oh man, no kidding, right? We're going to be coming to this kid. There he sent the wrong thing. It couldn't decipher it. He couldn't read it. So now... Now he sets to the right toggles, and it's now the box is able to decrypt the message. Oh my God, that is amazing! Using light transmission, he has a career at the uh, various three-letter agencies. I think. Uh, kind, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hate to say that, but I mean clearly, I mean he's either going to be uh, working for uh, one side or the other. But he's got some skills. <laughs> no, no, I want him to save us for the from the zombie apocalypse. I'm okay with that too. It's uh, this is on the Arduino blog. We'll have it <laughs> linked in so the show awesome. notes. There he is with his project at the Maker Fair in I think it was in um, very talented young man Rome. I think this was a Maker Fair in Rome. Wow. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure it is. I mean, you know, kids, kids here are certainly uh, off. You're probably doing other things, and so that might be something that he might had more access to. It, and, it, it, this it reminds me of, and mm-hmm. I don't know it, when I was a kid, you could buy these um, these science kit mm-hmm. like I boards, and you could punch stuff in. Did you? Ra- have one yeah, of I had crystal radio kit. I yeah. had a very, I made like very an sci- alarm for my room. Yeah, very science boards. So yeah. This stuff reminds me of that for this generation. Only it's, it's a lot cooler. It's freaking internet connected. Yeah. Uh, it runs Linux. Yeah. I mean, it's so much cooler it's really exciting and and uh and i know that like you and i i don't think you and i both properly wrap our heads around beagle board or the arduino or the raspberry pi like we get them we we like them we've used them for a few things but these guys like this is their world yeah i mean they could you could really i i I think people could even get into like home automation type projects with it you know yeah, uh, I'd love to set up like a garage door now, monitor. Yeah, the chat like room, the chat room, of course, because it's the internet. They're like, ah, his dad did it. Uh, no, if you read the interview with this kid, he oh, is. I, bl- I believe he did it. He's really sharp. Um, it, I like, like honestly, in the interview, I felt dumb like reading some of the things this kid was saying. I was yeah. like, wow. Yeah. So congratulations. That's. That's one of the coolest runs Linux ever, and it makes me want to build little projects. It like really that. does, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, so, what a great thing to do with your kids. I don't know if you noticed, Matt, but uh, I'm on Ubuntu 14.04 today. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I'm you know, that looks oddly familiar. And I got the Numix theme on here because I just I think I like that a little better. I decided I'm living in it, even though it's still in beta. I'm living mm-hmm. in it right now until, uh, 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 you know, it's like... I don't know. I just feel like I, so I can get a good I can get a good grasp of it for our review. I think we're gonna the le- review because the way Linux Fest is gonna land. I think we'll be reviewing it next Sunday on the show. So I've been running okay. it for a week. I'll keep running. I suggest you run it when you get home. Yeah, tonight, load it up. It's uh, I still have Arch installed, but I got to tell you, well, it's got the stuff you want. It's got the yeah. theme you want. It's got and I'm it's getting got work Steam, done. So I got you're my happy. Numix on there. I'm feeling at home. <laughs> I really right. am. All right, Matt. Cool. Well, before we get to the rest of our picks this week, I want to thank our sponsor, and that is DigitalOcean. What is DigitalOcean? DigitalOcean is simple cloud hosting dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. Now, some folks in our audience have done uh, the Bama Jamas in like... 47 seconds they've been able to set up a cloud server. And that's probably because they're SSD powered, they have tier one bandwidth, but most users can create a cloud server in 55 seconds. If Mm -hmm. you beat the 47 second record, let me know. I want a screenshot though. Uh, And of course they have pricing plans starting only $5 per month for 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. And that's all a fixed Mm. cost. You know exactly how much you're going to be spending. Plus, DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, and Amsterdam. So you can get all over the world, and they have multiple data center locations. And their interface is super simple, very with a very intuitive control panel, and they have an API, so power users can replicate that control panel on a much larger scale with some automation. And you know, one of the things that I love about DigitalOcean is their investment in Linux, their investment in Docker, and the fact that they had the foresight to realize that they should build their entire service offering around SSD hard drive years ago. It all sits on top of KVM, which runs on some amazing hardware. They have private networking that enables droplets to talk with other droplets in the same data center. That could be a great way to have a web server on the front with a data uh, with a database server on the back end that doesn't necessarily have a, a public address and the system is so easy to get going and set up and the cost is so reasonable that uh, folks in our in our audience in the Jupiter colony uh, G+ um, community have been discussing what they're using their DigitalOcean droplets for. So Stephen Martin said he's going to turn it into a WordPress instance. Uh, And uh, Benjamin DeCamp said he's using it for Minecraft. Temple Pate also is using it for WordPress and OwnCloud. So is Matt McGraw. He's using it for OwnCloud for his business. Uh, Paul Harbinger has it for a personal web server, MediaWiki, a TTRSS server. Oh, wow. that teeny, a tiny, tiny RSS server is a great That's idea. That's a great idea. I have that sure. on my LAN right now, but the nice thing about having a tiny RSS server on a DigitalOcean mm-hmm. droplet is then it would be much easier when I'm on my 
Android device to read exactly. it. Exactly. He also has his per- personal Arch repo over there with AUR packages built inside a clean cheroot. Um, Jeff Jensen has Minecraft, own cloud, BitTorrent Sync, <laughs> wow. Virtual Box going on there. Uh, so there's well, uh, the, check out the Jupiter Colony uh, community if you're looking for some ideas for DigitalOcean Droplet. Because here's the great part. If you use the promo code LAS, April, L-A-S, April, all one word, mm-hmm. you'll get a $10 credit, and that means you can use the $5 droplet for free for two months. This is a great opportunity to learn, to start development on something, on something that's reliable, something that's mm-hmm. public, something that's fast. This is also just a great way to move some services that you maybe want to pull back from some of the cloud offerings out there that aren't under your control and put them on a box where you have snapshot capabilities so you can make sure your data is safe, where you have root access so you know exactly what's running on that machine, and where you can monitor it from top to bottom and add services as you see fit and integrate services as you see fit. So go over to DigitalOcean.com. They are an awesome sponsor yes, of the Linux are. Action Show. And use that promo code last April when you check out to get a $10 credit. And uh, they also have an update on there for anybody that's uh, concerned about the Heartbleed update. And something else that they've asked me to pass along is they are are actively hiring too. DigitalOcean is growing like crazy right now, and so they're looking for new engineers. DigitalOcean.com and a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring that the is Linux Action so Show. So cool! It, they are. I was just like, it, it. It literally is cost ineffective not to jump on this. It really is, and it's so awesome to see a company grow like that based on mm-hmm. Linux technology and have them. Uh, not just contribute to our show, which helps the Linux community, but also like actually contribute to open source projects, right. work upstream, and things like that. And potentially hire you. You know, go apply. Yeah. Why not? So this is speaking of things you could run on DigitalOcean Droplet. I was picturing it on a LAN server, but this would probably work really well on a DigitalOcean Droplet too. Uh, Definitely. I don't know. Are you familiar with uh, like the uh, bookmarking site Delicious? Oh yeah. And yeah. Uh, the one I use now is Pinboard. It's it's good, but it's pay. And, and all of these are, are nice, but uh, there has been instances where they've been subpoenaed and somebody's entire bookmark Ugh. collection was, was pulled, right? Oh, wow. Uh, so uh, it, this is what brought me to Bookie. Uh, Bookie is an open source project to replace Delicious that you can run on your own machine. It imports Ooh. Delicious, Google Bookmarks, Google Chrome Bookmarks, and mm-hmm. Firefox Bookmarks. It has extensions for Google Chrome and Firefox, so you can save right to it. You can do tagging, you can do notes, you can do shared, private... Uh, and this is this. I was thinking this would be great for just the Jupiter Broadcasting yeah. crew. It has an Android app, so you can also, when you're browsing a website, like mm-hmm. saying Chrome on the Android device, you can say Share. Then you can choose uh, this, and it'll save a bookmark for you. Yeah, no, this is like a really that. good way if you like have to pull in a lot of news for your job mm-hmm. and things like that. Uh, it supports SQLite, MySQL, and Postgres, and it also renders pretty good on a mobile device. So it's called Bookie. That's uh, B O O K I E. Easy to remember. Yeah, and it's docs.bmark.us. And if you're familiar with Pinboard or uh, Delicious, then you know the advantage. Of this, if you if you struggled with shared bookmarks or how to manage your bookmarks after a format and a wipe, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Bookie might also be a really good option for you. Uh, it could be a great way for like an IT department to share important resource links. Like, hey, what was that great tool? Well, since you can tag it, right. you could go in there and search for all tools related to Ubuntu. They'd all pull up, and even if it was Greg or Matt or Bill mm-hmm. or whoever that had tagged it, you could go see it. And so that's what I could see it working for groups. I could see it working for individuals. I could see it working for podcasters. Right. So it looks like a really great option, and I'm a big fan of anything that, you know, again, allows me to take all these cloud services inside my my firewall, manage it myself, exactly. under my control. And then I also, like, you know, if Yahoo decides to do something crazy with Delicious down the road... And that could happen. Worry. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it does happen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that is our desktop pick. It is called Bookie, and we have a link to that in the show notes. Yes. Okay. So... Every now and then, I spotlight something that's a little cray-cray. Uh, this is not something for your average user. It's okay. probably only going to appeal to a minority, but the old sysadmin in me just got all kinds of hot and bothered when I read about Core OS. Mm. Now, uh, we're going to reach out to Core OS and see if maybe in the future we could talk to somebody from their project, because okay. this is blowing my mind. You can go to coreos.com to find out more about it. If you're a Linux uh, Weekly Net subscriber, they have a great write-up on it. Here's a few things, Matt. Get your yeah. brain buckle ready for this. Okay. This first part, well, like I, I don't want you to get hung up on this first part. I'll try. I'll try I and for see past it. So yeah. I want to talk to the developers about this specifically because it's probably not a big deal. Okay. Core OS is originally based on Chrome OS. Whoa. And it's, okay. this is for data centers. Okay. Uh, it has a much larger and different target than the mobile focused distribution. Core itself calls it Linux for massive server deployments. 
By using a double buffering technique on each of the full system updates, any problems, like when you do an update, like the right. cause from an update, can be fixed by simply rolling back. So like my PF Sense box, it does a buffered snapshot of the existing system before an update. You apply the update, and if it doesn't work, you can do an immediate rollback at boot up. Oh. All applications are deployed in their own self-contained Docker instance. Oh, that's kind of nice. Like which that. decouples applications from the operating system updates, so you don't break applications there. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. CoreOS is designed to run fine on a single machine, but it's clearly targeted for clusters. It comes with a number of features such as automatic service discovery, a distributed key value store for shared configuration called etcd, distributed locking for the file system, master election, the, and uh, they, all of these features make it well for a cluster environment. Mm-hmm. They have a fleet orchestration tool which teams up with systemd and etcd to deploy applications to the machines throughout the cluster in Docker containers and it can maintain a number of applications running at any given time starting and restarting applications as required. Uh, it's mo- the, A lot of the management is licensed under Apache 2 and of course all the Linux stuff is under GPL. The latest version as of this writing which is uh, 273.0 uses kernel 3.3, uh, 3.13.6 which is pretty new that is pretty for reasonable. an enterprise distro. Yeah. Quite, and of course, Docker 9.1. Uh, as one would guess, CoreOS mm-hmm. system looks much like a regular Linux system when you log in, mm-hmm. but there are big differences. For one, CoreOS is inger- engineered to be much smaller than a standard Linux installation. It uses roughly 50% of the RAM usage of boot, and they have a little infographic for this. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, it does come with a package. It doesn't come with a package manager oh, like it does Yammer not. app. Oh. Instead, it uses Docker to install the applications. Oh, CoreOS yeah. uses System oh, D like as part of its distributed init system. Mm-hmm. System D is deeply integrated into the distribution for a number of reasons, including the boot speed, socket activation, and the System D journal. System D is used to start and stop Docker containers, which hold various pieces of the distributed system, much like System D handles managing regular services for other distributions. And the other thing that's kind of interesting about that this is kind of cool. This Etsy D system yeah. is a way to have a distributed slash Etsy configuration system, so you can wow. make application configurations across the entire cluster. So this core OS that sounds pretty compelling. I mean, even I mean, if you're just really running on a single box, it's you know I love the idea of painless updating. Mm-hmm. I love like I was thinking the Docker uh, instances really kind of speak to me. It's like hey. yeah, that's what I was thinking about doing is because I was thinking about for my home server maybe yeah. like an Arch base with Docker containers, maybe like with an Ubuntu mm-hmm. twelve oh four for my mail server, yep. right? Exactly. But this is kind of doing that for us, um, uh, and the distributed tools are really neat if you did need to grow out. Uh, you could totally see how you could deploy this in a data center. So that's CoreOS. You can find it at coreos.com. Mm-hmm. It's pretty new. Um, and uh, we have it on our radar. Hopefully, uh, maybe we can make it happen. If anybody from CoreOS is watching, email production at jupiterbroadcasting.com. We'd like to chat with you guys because it looks like a really awesome distribution, but it also is a distribution that's been taking advantage of a lot of the things we've been covering on our shows, System D mm-hmm. and Docker specifically, right? Those have been threads, topic threads right. for, for months and months now. And we, one of the things we've said is these types of technologies are going to enable a whole new category of server operating system. And I think CoreOS represents a little bit of what we've been seeing come down the pipe. Well, I think I like the direction they're going. I also think that I've gotten past the whole Chrome OS you know, base yeah. that they were talking about. Because at first you're thinking, oh, isn't that adorable? But... You know, based on what they're describing, that uh, sounds kind of cool. Yeah, it does. Sounds kind of cool. So I'm looking forward to checking it out in the future, mm-hmm. and uh, maybe we'll have a review on the big show, and maybe even an interview Ooh. with one of the developers if we get really lucky. That'd be nice. All right, Matt, let's do the news. Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by... Ting.com. Matt, go to last.ting.com to get started. What is Ting? Ting is mobile that makes sense. It's a no BS mobile service, and I really, truly, absolutely mean that. I've never felt it more than I do right now. Ish. Last.ting.com to get started. Here's what's great about Ting. $6 $6 flat rate, no contract, and you just pay for your usage and your taxes on top of that. And this has been so awesome for me as because, first of all, I'm streaming like crazy right. as I'm driving between the studio like several times a day. I'm using data over there like nuts, and it has been so awesome to know that I'm not going to get overages. I'm not going to get some sort of I, – I, the worst part about overages, too – is you pay so much money into your cell phone bill mm-hmm. because they, they lock you into these fixed like pricing structures that they know they can extract the most money right. out of you. Right. And you pay into something that you never get full value out of. And then that one time, there are two, three times where you just need a little bit more, they just 
get you. And mm. Ting is changing all of that up. So the way they do this is it's twofold. They're an MVNO. That means they're not spending the money on the cell towers. They're spending nice. the money on customer service. They're spending the money on making the back end for the customers the best possible, like the dashboard, like their no-hold customer service. You can call them at 1-855-TING-FTW anytime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., and a real human answers the phone. So they're able to focus on these kinds of things. And the, that's part one. Okay. Number two is they don't do this gimmick that I think is pretty much unique to the U.S., where they subsidize the price of the phone. Oh, yes. And yeah. And you don't actually own your phone. Right. You know, You're we're, paying we into this phone. And, and the problem with that is at the end of that two years, there's no incentive for you to keep that phone around That's anymore. Right. Exactly. And that... You have no vested interest, you know. But yeah, that ting, you do. That bugs me. That's wasteful. That yeah, These devices go in landfills way right. too much. But... When you continue to get the full value out of your device from the very beginning to even after the contract, it makes it very easy to hand a phone down, Absolutely. to keep using it as just a dedicated hotspot, because again, you're just paying for the usage. So that even the long-term value model with Ting is fundamentally better and better structured than the main mobile carrier. Well, I have an interesting example of that. For uh, for example, I have, an, I have another smartphone that if I am no longer uh, using it as a smartphone, meaning I'm no longer paying that data plan, it's mm -hmm. been dumbed down. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm limited. Mm -hmm. But with Ting, I don't have that problem. No. It's great. No, there's no separate tiers like That's that. right. And every Ting plan includes hotspot, tethering, caller ID, picture messaging, text messaging, all the stuff you'd expect, and, and, an, and an awesome dashboard, and an awesome Ting app to manage your devices. And the other thing that's really great about Ting, and you get a sense of this if you visit their blog or follow them on Twitter or G+, they're really mm -hmm. active on G+, too. They are actually Android enthusiasts. And to that yes. end, this is a great app I'm going to go pick up after the show. It's called Onvo, Onvo, Onvo I think. Huh? Uh, we'll let, we'll let uh, I think her name's Kyra, we'll let her tell us. Because yeah. this looks like yeah. a great app of the week. This would be my pick if I was going to pick one. Do you want to use less mobile data without having to switch up your smartphone routine? I'm Kyra, and this is Ting's App of the Week. Love the music. Onava Extend is a data compression app that directs your information through Onava servers. If you often check Instagram, listen to podcasts, or browse the web, it's a great way to reduce your monthly usage. When first opening the app, follow Onava's instructions to establish a VPN connection on your device. Once enabled, Onava automatically starts compressing data sent across your mobile network. The Overview tab displays a total amount of data saved, along That's with cool. percentages That's saved amazing. in each app. Based on these savings, oh Onava tells you how many extra emails you can send, <laughs> articles crap. you can read, and photos you can share to end up at your standard Whoa. uncompressed usage. If you're with a pay-for-what-you-use provider, you may just want to stick with the extra savings you're seeing each month. You'll get the same mobile experience with a reduced rate. Tap the top bar to view monthly reports. You can sort by the last seven days or the entire month and see your overall savings in each specific app. The settings tab includes several useful tools. If you're looking to save even more data, you can reduce the quality of images or yeah. increase the max cache size. Nice. There's also an option to alert you if the app is ever accidentally disabled. And so what I like about this is, um, like, Google and a bunch of other guys, they have, they have like, Am uh, Amazon does too. They have their own compression systems, mm -hmm. right. but you have no idea what they're doing with them. This is a VPN and a compression system in one, and Ting links to the privacy policy so you can read up on how they protect your data too, because Ting takes that into consideration. And this is... Again, going back to the value model, Ting is literally structured so that the happier you are, the better off they are. Like, they don't need to extract the most data out of you, the most transfer. Like, they constantly are doing ways to save you money, like Google Voice and VoIP tricks. Well, because and I think they see the value and retention of a yes, happy customer. That's th that's valuable to everybody. That's truly the benefit of the MVNO model. And right. plus, the, the the great part is, is if you haven't checked out the new Sprint for a while, you might want to, because mm -hmm. they after they were acquired by SoftBank or partnered with SoftBank, they initiated the Sprint Vision Network Vision uh, program, and they've rolled out LTE and tri-band LTE to 300. I think the total now with all LTE coverage is 400 locations in the U.S. Right. So over the last year, they have been doubling down on coverage. So go over to last.ting.com to get started, even if you're not getting a phone. Maybe you want to get their Novatel MiFi 5580. Lifesaver. <laughs> last.ting.com will get you that device for $119, and then it's just a $6 hotspot mm -hmm. after that. You just pay for what you use, and when you need a hotspot, you've got one. Last.ting.com, $119. 19 bucks out of your pocket, and then it's just a $6 mobile hotspot with tri-band LTE. You gotta love that, right? Yeah. So last.ting.com, and a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Action And doesn't show. that device also, like, just in those unusual areas, do, like, uh, sports WiMAX or something as well? Uh, I don't know about this one, maybe. Oh, okay. Some yeah. of them do. Some of them do. They'll, you know, so you have yeah. options. So if you're in a really crowded area, it's like, hey, you know, you can go to something else. But yes. I love the fact that you yes. got a, you got a hotspot This one does. I think this one does. There the, we go. This, yeah. This, this, this is Netgear one does. Netgear, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's really cool. And it's got that cool OLED mm -hmm. screen on it, too. Likeies. 
Very nice. All right, okay. Matt. Well, I want to talk about probably one of the biggest security stories of this year, and unfortunately, it has a pretty significant tie-in with Linux and yeah. open source. Boy. Everybody at this point has heard of the Heartbleed OpenSSL vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Um, my my horrible brief explanation of this is essentially um, OpenSSL was trusting the packet length declaration of the Heartbeat um, packet, and it would just accept whatever it said its length was and commit that to memory. And if you know it was longer than it actually said, the bits that were longer could actually be used to read the contents of the host system running OpenSSL. Ooh. So the problem with this vulnerability is you could remotely, just by sending Heartbleed packets, actually extract in 64K chunks a host memory. And in memory of a server is usernames, it's yeah. all kinds of credentials. It's, it's a really yeah. huge, massive vulnerability. Um, and and this has led to a lot of finger pointing, a lot of proclamations of what the NSA may or may not be doing with this exploit. And uh, we can talk about that in a second. Uh, but Bloomberg ran a really damning piece, and it's a multifaceted damning piece. First of all, the whole piece hinges on two people familiar with the matter. But that could be two people from the low levels of the Obama administration. Yeah, it could be knows? an intern at the NSA. We don't really know. But supposedly, the agency's decision was to keep the information about Heartbleed a secret in pursuit of national security interest. Um, mm. They say that after declining to comment, though, the NSA says, at first they declined to comment. Now they've come out and said, no, we never knew about Heartbleed. We're not using yeah. it. Now, it's up to you if you want to believe yeah, that or not. That, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> but here's what I, uh, here's what I don't like. Um, and this piece goes on to, to lay it on pretty hard to the NSA. They said, uh, putting the Heartbleed bug in its arsenal, the NSA was able to obtain passwords and other basic data that are the building blocks of the sophisticated hacking operations at the core of its mission, but at a cost. Millions of ordinary users were left vulnerable to attack from other nations' intelligence arms and criminal hackers. It flies in the face of the agency's commitment to the defense, and defense comes first, says Jason Healy, the director of the Cyber Statecraft Initiative. Boy, that's a name. At the yeah. Atlantic Council. That guy's probably awesome. <laughs> They're going to be completely shredded by the computer security community for this. Now, they are so far, like... Okay, yeah, if that's true, they are. But here's where the article kind of went off the rails when it started talking about open source. So they continue to go on about the NSA. They say the NSA and other elite intelligence agencies devote millions of dollars to hunt for common software flaws Mm -hmm. that are critical to stealing data from secure computers. Open source protocols like OpenSSL, where the flaw was found, are the primary targets. And their logic essentially is, is because the NSA has so many experts, they can just look at the code, find these exploits, and use them. Here's what they go on to say. Now, this isn't substantiated, of course, Mm -hmm. Uh, but they say the heartbeat flaw, introduced in early 2012, so it's been around for about two years, yeah. is just a minor adjustment to the open SSL protocol, and it highlights one of the failings of open source software development. While many internet companies rely on free code, its integrity to only depends on a small number of underfunded researchers who devote their energies to the projects. In contrast, the NSA has more than a thousand experts devoted to ferreting out such flaws using sophisticated analysis techniques, many of them classified. The agency found Heartbleed shortly after its introduction, according to these sources, people familiar with the matter, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it became, basic, it became a basic part of the agency's toolkit for stealing account passwords and other common tasks. So a couple of things. Okay. Uh, this is based on people familiar with the matter. These aren't Snowden leaks. That's not where they're getting right. this from. Okay. But what That's do you think about... What do you think about this part where they say the heartbeat, heartbleed flaw in OpenSSL highlights one of the failings of open source software development? And I, here, I'll, here I'll, I'll add a little texture to that. Because what do we always hear? We always hear, I don't want to use BitTorrent Sync. It's not open source. I can't trust it. I don't want to use XYZ. It's not open source. I can't trust it. When right. something's open, it's being audited by thousands of users on the internet, and you can't hide a flaw in there because people will find it. Yet here we go, an absolutely fundamentally critical flaw in one of the most widely used security protocols on the internet for two years had a major hole in it that nobody caught. Is this... Is this perhaps a bit of a reality check for the open source development model, Matt? No, I think it comes down because I mean, I don't, closed source to open source. It, it, I, in my opinion, it doesn't matter. So here, here's the meat and potatoes of it. Whether you have a closed sourced app or an open source app, the NSA is still going to have those dollars to work with. They're still going to have the personnel to work with. And yes, kids, they're still going to find those exploits, right? Um, mm-hmm. Because that's what they're dedicated to doing. And the, actually, the, just to interrupt for a second mm-hmm. to that end, because I just under, underscore your point. Yeah. Um, I've ran stories in either in TechSnap and Unfilter where, and specifically, we talked about it for, at length in TechSnap. Um, the NSA has specifically millions of dollars of budget to partner with companies like Microsoft, mm-hmm. and they have a partnership in place where before Microsoft patches a zero day because they have a month, yeah. they notify the NSA as soon as they become aware of it, and so. 
the, these yeah. these commercial companies have institutionalized cooperating with the yeah. NSA. Exactly. So that so the the licensing really, in my opinion, has no no play on it. That's not to say that open source projects could certainly use more funding or more personnel to help them out with things, but that doesn't happen. Here here's yeah. my here's my rule of thumb for anything. Okay. If it executes code, it can be used maliciously yeah. <laughs> period if it's not even you know if it can execute code it can be used maliciously so i don't care what the licensing so much is so in this particular case they're using this almost like as a straw man type situation. well let me give you a, there's a double whammy so, here and you know, um, it doesn't really add up full credit to alan in this week's episode of tech snap i think it was 157 we spent an hour just talking about Heartbleed, and Alan did an awesome job of breaking down the timeline. Mm-hmm. He he discussed the different open source communities' uh, responses, including Theo Durat's responses to this. So he explained how it works. So if you are still struggling with Heartbleed and don't quite understand why it's such a big deal, go watch last week's episode of TechSnap. It's, it's yeah. super in-depth. Now, here's the part that Alan brought up. is This is sort of the double whammy aspect. The open SSL developers wrote in code to bypass certain operating systems and memory cleanup that would have prevented this, like OpenBSD, for example, has provisions to sort of prevent these kinds of things from happening. But OpenSSL was using its own memory allocation internal logic to trick the operating system's memory allocator to to keep that to keep that information in memory, basically. Sure. And so we have two problems here. The first problem is nobody caught this heart be- heartbleed flaw for quite a while. Well, nobody that disclosed it publicly. Mm-hmm. The second problem is is the original memory allocation implementation in OpenSSL is bypassing safety features in other operating systems, Ooh. and that Ooh. was never caught, or at wow. least it was caught but never fixed. Right. I think it goes back to what you just said a couple of minutes ago. This is one of these things that I wish I could collectively kick the entire internet in the nuts over. Yeah. Because so many people like Google and Amazon are that have making, those resources. Are yeah. making money off of infrastructure that uses code like OpenSSL and they're not doing enough to fund it. They're not doing enough to look at it. Mm-hmm. They're not auditing it properly. These companies, it is in their best interest, just like Red Hat did an audit of their uh, SSL library recently to find that sort of go-to fail equivalency. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All these big companies that rely on this for e-commerce it is it is their responsibility to their customers to be auditing this code and i think that we need to see this as a wake-up call to fundamentally say this stuff that's infrastructure a do we need to look at it and see if maybe it needs to be written in a language that has better better memory management out of the get-go that's a i think we have to discuss that b we have to discuss how we can get more money and more eyeballs if if the people working on these things are not working on it full-time that is a failure on all of us collectively but it's a failure on these big companies that have the cloud services too and that really upsets me that's what i think at the core bothers me the Mm -hmm. most and it is a massive deal, and I want to encourage all of you to go watch that episode of TechSnap. Go get LastPass or KeyPass or whatever you want. Maybe we should do a roundup of password management. That would actually be an excellent time for it. Yeah. Because you need to start changing your passwords once these guys get this patched. Uh, it's a it's a big deal, and it is a bit of a black mark on open source security, but I, I think the track record for open source clearly still outshines closed source software and what we fundamentally come back to is these types of flaws could be in all i mean look at apple's go to fail right Mm -hmm. that's a perfect example of something that well that was an open source component but it's a perfect example of how a commercial company can have commercial code that they use that they still don't catch as well microsoft could have flaws like this in windows we just don't know about it right? right so i go back to at the end of the day even those things like open ssl these open source projects can have critical flaws the long term bet for me is still on code that I know can be audited publicly. If you want true security, that's the best long-term bet. Even if there's temporary setbacks, the solution is not closed source uh, software vendors' no. magic box Be- solution. Because here, at the end of the day, the thing you got to remember is that while it may take time, and, and obviously in this particular case it does, the odds are fair that eventually this stuff's going to come to light if it's open source, because eventually somebody's going to squeal, someone's going to mention it. When you have those behind-the-scenes situations like you had with Microsoft and you have with the NSA, uh, you know, you may never know. Right, you, exactly. You, you know, I mean, so you really, until somebody leaks a until massive document. Leaks, exactly, until it becomes a big, you know, big yeah. Snowden type Look at all the stuff that's been going on under so, our noses, right? something to think about. Yes, yeah. it is. Well, last week we saw the passing of Windows XP support. Uh, we talked about it. We had a great Linux Unplugged about the whole mm-hmm. topic, actually. Uh, and I was really happy to see it. And I, I, gra- I meant to grab the name of the of the, of the um, Reddit user who submitted it to our subreddit. But uh, on the uh, New York Times personal tech site, there's a rather positive article about switching to Linux. Very wow. real. Wow. And I just think it's it's 
That's cool. It's kind of a big deal when the New York Times runs a pretty good piece right? about Linux. So Very mainstream. It starts out with, it might not be widely known, but Linux did revolutionize computing. If you own an Android phone or a Kindle e-reader, you're a Linux user. Linux is at the core of most popular devices and is found in a variety of other places, from the world's most powerful supercomputers down to tiny Raspberry Pi devices that's among uh, electricians, electronics hobbyists. So this is uh, from Thomas J. Fitzgerald. He wrote this for the New York Times. He says, fewer than 2% of desktops or laptops computers run it, according to a survey by Net Applications. I, I always find those to be a little dubious because a lot of people yeah. dual boot. So the, yeah, it's a, and it's a, double sta- it's a double problem because of the fact that they need something to cite for yeah, these articles. Exactly. And so they reach out to what's yeah. available, and yeah. it's always wrong, but whatever. Uh, he goes on to say that could be because the bulk of Windows and Mac users are switching. Uh, it, may not be, it might not make sense for them to switch entirely to Linux, but exploring Linux could still be a worth time for those looking for a proven, low-cost alternative to the mainstream operating systems. Mm-hmm. Now, his first distro pick, I thought this was interesting, was in Ubuntu. Really? It wasn't Mint. It was Bodai Linux. Wow. That's yeah. kind of... I'm. That's pleasant. I, and, and, I, that's kind of unique. I wouldn't have thought that. He says there's many types of Linux at the huh. core. They're all kind of the same, but their interfaces and applications may differ. Uh, Bodai Linux is all about minimalism and performance, which, you know, if you're thinking about you're switching an XP oh, computer, so that kind of makes sense. he actually did his home... You yeah. know what? Thumbs up to you. You right. didn't just, like, immediately right. go to DistroWatch and pick something. You, I mean, some people might be putting these, like, on yeah. P4s, but right? that's cool. He says this makes it an option for older, lower-end oh. systems. The desktop setup called Enlightenment is frugal with resources while offering eye-catching and straightforward experience. The desktop is free of clutter, mm-hmm. and the taskbar is well organized, and menus are easy to navigate. The other state stated ideal of Bodai is choice. While only a basic set of applications are installed by default, users can download from an app center with free software organized in all categories like office, education, and multimedia. Wow. So that's the best singing endorsement he gives. Then, yeah. then he gets to go south. Yeah. Then he goes. His next distribution is Linux Mint. Okay. Mm, yeah, and uh, this is something I think I want to explore more mm. on a uh, Linux Unplugged. I have a lot of respect for Linux Mint, but I, I don't know if I, w- I don't, I don't know. Well, if that's it not is my the- go-to thing for yeah. older machines. I mean, that's yeah. something I go for modern. And I want to machines. talk more about yeah. that because I think a lot of people might be like, "What Mint's the perfect choice?" So maybe mm. we might make yeah. that a future Unplugged topic. He says Linux Mint offers a choice of desktop environments, including one called Cinnamon. A Mac user or Windows user may find Cinnamon intuitive to navigate. That's pretty much all he yeah. has to say about Mint yeah. for the most part. He then mentions Ubuntu. He says one of the more widely known versions of Linux. True. Okay, that's, okay, that's accurate. Yeah. So you start. It's always interesting. It's like when when you work with somebody and somebody says, "Hey, what's uh, Chris like?" Chris is uh, he's a great guy. He's got a strong personality. Like it's like kind of like you know one of those. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Uh, he says the installation program can replace an existing system, or in some cases, set Ubuntu to be an option when the computer starts up. The desktop environment is called Unity, and has a tablet-like look. I don't. I feel I just, like I'd have gone more with Mac like, but yeah, okay. I feel know. like you know it's more like a dock, but right? I could see it. I the mean, integrated menu. You look like you want to touch the stuff. I get it. I guess I don't know. Whatever. Cool. Yeah, Ubuntu comes with a collection of applications. He talks about those, and the only problem is he also plugs Ubuntu One. He says it comes with five gigabytes of free storage for photos and music. Yeah, I think uh, I think that part was a little drive by. Yeah. I think he probably surfed the page. And, then he talks about Fedora again, starting with facts. Fedora starts in 2013. It's gained a reputation as a testing ground for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Mm-hmm. Okay, GNOME three environment departs departs from tradition. The user is presented with an empty desktop area, no taskbar, no dock, or start button. Then he mentions elementary OS. He says it's another flavor with ease of use and performance. Okay. He says, of course, numerous other types of Linux are available. For more technical versions, consider Slackware, Arch, or if you prefer baby steps, look at Zorin, which emulates aspects of Windows. <laughs> Linux is not for everyone, but if you, if you feel constrained by Windows or Mac OS X, it can offer a way out. And if you enjoy choice and flexibility, you may just become hooked. Overall, a good article. I, I don't have a lot of gripes with it. Yeah. I mean, there's a few areas that need some, some love. And the timing is, I mean, you can't yeah. beat the timing when the weak XP's coming to an end, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. Maybe that's, yeah, I mean, overall, I mean, he he was fairly accurate for the most part. Yeah. You know, I, I probably picked some different desktop environments for Linux Mint, but that's okay. So, uh, we got a lot of great games that have come to Linux, and there's some great ones in the pipeline. Uh, Steam just, like, greenlighted, like, another 37 games nice. last week. It's pretty awesome. But one thing that's been kind of missing, I mean, there's some... There's some options out there, but there's not a there's not a racing games. We kind of have a we have a lack there, and yeah. really good yeah. space games. Right? Yeah, we did, you can never have enough space games. You know? Now yeah. uh, there are a lot of people out there that are really excited because at PAX East, which just was launched uh, was going on this week uh, between April 11th and the 13th, so uh, it wraps up today. Oh, okay. Oh, during a live panel. The developer of Star Citizen, which is a space co- uh, sort of space sim space game, confirmed sure. that it is coming for Linux. And our subreddit oh is so goodness. excited. Here is a little gameplay footage. I just wanted to whet your appetite. This is live Ooh. gameplay footage, not pre-rendered oh, from Pax. Look, see, look at that. 
Oh, by the way, some G-Force effects right there you just saw. Pull too many Gs. So you can go in the cockpit. That would be me right there. You can be, uh, let's see, there's also, uh, let's see, find it. There's an outside the cockpit view, so you can look outside the cockpit. Doesn't that look great? That looks oh, fan oh. freaking tough. Oh, and he crashed. <laughs> nice. But, and, and it's a good crash. So you can, okay, you, we'll can do it over again. you can get out, you walk up to your ship. How oh, cool is this? Dude, I, we need this. And how right much now. I thought the animation now. of the helmet was gone. Cool. Oh, now, okay. this was a Kickstarter project. In fact, our very own Rekai like, kicked in like, the most money he's ever kicked into a yeah. game to get this. People are really excited. And it wasn't confirmed to come for Linux, but at PAX East this week. I love the audience roll. Yeah, wow. yeah. Like, yeah. there's a, like, here's a good spot. Here's a good scene right here. So Ooh. look at that. He gets into a he gets into a bit of a dogfight. He locks on target right there. So there's the target lock assembly. And you okay. see that? How cool yep. is that effect, right? That is right? very, very cool. Yes. And now he'll fire on them. <laughs> They're all true. Yeah. 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 I can't wait. Oh, this is going to be... So uh, I don't know what the time is yet, so I'll keep an eye out. But Star Citizen, it was a Kickstarter game, and it was just announced at PAX East this week that is coming like for it. Linux. It's one of the many awesome games. We are getting there's. Uh, I've linked to additional gameplay footage in the show notes and uh, Steam. I assume. I think. Okay. John RSS is the one that submitted it to the subreddit. So thanks, John, for mm. catching that. And it Very looks cool. so awesome. If oh you're not, yeah. If you're not watching the video version, I have a screenshot in the show notes and I've linked to the YouTube video. You should totally go check it out. It is definitely a next gen graphics mm -hmm. game, and it. I can't wait to go live in a spaceship, Matt. Yay! All right, Matt. That's all the news for this week. It's time to see if the NUC truly is a Mac Mini killer, and if you could make a no-compromises Linux desktop from a tiny, tiny computer. It is pretty impressive. And first, I want to tell you about our segment sponsor, System76. Now, this is where you're going to go to find complete solutions with end-to-end -end support. You're going to get a Linux box. Out of the box, that thing's running Linux flawlessly. It is born to run Linux mm -hmm. from System76.com. We often talk about their awesome Ultra Pro laptop, and the, I have the Bonobo Extreme, which I, I am absolutely still in love with. They also have a fantastic line of desktops. Yes. The uh, Rattel Performance is my sleeper favorite. We've got a wild dog that we're constantly beating on. The thing never misses a beat. And the Leopard Extreme, if you need ultimate engineering performance. And I think, you know, for like a studio setting, for like a photo management collection, the Sable Complete could be a really great option. There's so many mm -hmm. great devices, laptops, desktops, whatever it is. Go over to system76.com. Get a system where you have a little peace of mind, where you know you're not going to be fighting your hardware. You get to play with your Linux. And, you know, with new releases coming out, too, it's always great to have some hardware you know is going to be able to update without any problem. This is true. 1404 is around the corner. And if you're on a System76 rig, you know you're not going to have a single issue. Love those guys. I love the fact that you know it's just going to... And it works with so many other distros just out of the box. And they're part of the community, too. You know, if you mm -hmm. check out their Google Plus feed right now, they've been doing uh, 14... or uh, Yeah, right? 14 days of Ubuntu 14.04, yeah. where they've been uh, posting each day their favorite feature of Ubuntu 14.04. So you can check out System76 on Google Plus. They've been highlighting some of the new goodies coming in the latest release of Ubuntu 14.04. Yes. And plus, you get to see some great shots, like team they're, shots right, and stuff like totally that. They're totally grubbing. It's Cat awesome. Cat pictures and whatnot. <laughs> And it's got he has glasses. It's so okay. uh, Matt, here we are. I got it all hooked up, so it's a little hard to oops, a little hard to pick up. But this here is the uh, Intel NUC. Here's what it looks like, all wired in and everything like that. Uh, so a couple of things to note right off the bat. This here, this unit as configured, I bought it all from Newegg, uh, and it ran me about uh, five hundred dollars when all was said wow. and done. Okay, so that's a chunk of change. Base price for the base unit is three hundred and sixty-four dollars. Then I it doesn't come with any RAM, so mm -hmm. I added uh, RAM. And uh, this unit comes with an i5 processor. So that's part of that 364 sure. price is that i5. And then I added, uh, in mine, I added 120 gigabyte SSD to save a little money. But in this, I think if I was going to buy another one, I'd put a 240 gigabyte. Now, these are mini PCIe MSATA internal solid state drives. These aren't like your standard solid oh, state so drives. Oh, so they're a completely different animal at that point. Okay. And they're fast. You know, that's right. the other benefit they have is they're really fast. So that's the NUC right there. It's pretty close to silent it's not absolutely silent it does have a little fan in there mm -hmm. um, but if you uh, it comes with a mounting bracket so you can actually mount it right behind your monitor Ooh, yes yeah. so that, if you did I like that you that. wouldn't be able to hear it at all i like that a lot so uh w what you're seeing here this uh this desktop is a gnome 312 mm -hmm. and this is running on the intel NUC. and uh you can see like right here here's the new uh, gnome 312g edit it's quite a bit different everything's under the hamburger menu now uh and there's been a few other changes in gnome 312 the, the way they handle open new tabs in the terminal is a little bit different. Um, Seems very responsive as you're opening is, up applications. This is what I wanted to talk about. Uh, so, 
at, out, of, out of the box, I was like, okay, this is a very good desktop. Mm-hmm. This is this feels like I I've gotten my money's worth. Right. That was my out of the box experience. Then uh, with the help of uh, Rikai, uh, our our editor, I got um, I, I it went literally from this is a pretty good experience to. This feels like a, a, the next generation of performance from a tiny computer, and uh, there's a. I'm gonna. T- I want to go over some of the tweaks that we made to make the NUC a little more performant. Okay. But I, out of the gate, I I, I did want to mention there are a few caveats you need to know with this newer generation of NUC. So if you're thinking about getting one, is this is this comes with the Iris graphics processor, so you're gonna have some gameplay, mm-hmm, but that's mm-hmm. your biggest limitation. Okay. It so you're, you're not gonna go GPU. play natural selection on this, obviously. Not right? not too unexpected. Right, In fact, yeah. if we get a chance, I'll I'll load up some games and I'll, yeah. I'll show them to you. But um, the other thing that got me is that you have to be careful in the later generation, the kind of RAM that you put in there. We we initially started, uh, because I got it as part of a kit, but the kit was outdated. Okay. Uh, it initially came with a 1.5 volt RAM. Oh. And you need to have, in, in order for this thing to even boot, your oh. RAM has to be 1.35 volts. And it's not it's not exceptionally clear, and some of the bundles still on Newegg have the higher voltage memory. It also requires a memory timing of, a, of 11, not 9, which is a different oh. from the older version. So it's a okay. little picky on the hardware. So my advice to you would be, Intel, we have it linked in the show notes, has a supported RAM module site. Mm. Out of all the things that y- you ever want to go by for this particular device, go by that. Makes sense. That definitely makes sense. Why? Why chance it? Um, and the other thing is, is if you're going to use it uh, on a composited desktop, if you're going to play video games, up that video memory. You can mm-hmm. do it in the BIOS. Here's what's crazy. This is a UEFI system, and it uses what's called a visual BIOS. You have never oh. seen a BIOS that looks so good. Really? Full mouse and keyboard. It's got a dark scheme UI. Wow. You navigate around in there. You can adjust thermal settings. You can turn on legacy boot mm-hmm. mode if you want BIOS emulation, and you can add memory. So I think we upped it to like 768 megabytes of RAM, and okay. I instantly noticed a pretty big performance improvement. So step number one, if you get a NUC, you need to dedicate more of your system RAM to it. And step number two, and, and this is all thanks to Rekai. He has linked these in the show notes. Uh, there are tweaks you can make to Xorg. Uh, first of all, you want to install the XF86 video Intel driver and mm-hmm. enable multi-lib if you're doing Arch. Sure. And then install Intel Lib32 or Lib32 Intel DRI. But the second thing you want to do is you want to enable glamour mode with the drivers. Glamour, glamour mode. mode. Okay. And, and I don't know about other distributions. I think it's the case. I think it's universal across all distributions. Mm-hmm. Glamour mode is not enabled by default. Oh. Now, it sounds fancy, right, Matt? It sounds very glamorous. Yes. Well, what it does is it actually enables T- 2D objects on the screen to be rendered using OpenGL. So as mm-hmm. you can see, when I'm moving around here, there is literally no performance lag. We have a right. full frame rate experience here. Uh, it's very, very responsive. The GNOME 312 UI is absolutely as poppy as it is on my Bonobo with a big, dedicated graphics card. That was a huge, huge difference. Also, if you're using GNOME, there's a little change you need to make to your Etsy environment to uh, change the way Clutter is doing some redraws, but we have that listed in the show notes. Mm -hmm. You make these tweaks, so you install that driver, you make that glamour mode tweak, you you make the GNOME tweak, and Matt, this is this is one of the fastest computers UI responsive wise I have ever used. Seriously, they, you take that little, you take this little uh, M SATA 120 gigabyte SSD. Mm-hmm. You take the i5 processor, and here's what's great about this processor: out of the gate, uh, like right now, if we go in and we look at our, uh, we look at our, uh, say we go, cat, oops, sorry, oh. sorry about the bark. Uh, we go look at uh, CPU info, right? Sure. Uh, currently, uh, my CPU is running probably pretty low, like around 1.3 gigahertz. Oh, actually, right now it's running at 998 gigahertz. Oh, wow, that's giga- nothing. Yeah. Right? Each individual core on this i5 processor can go up to 2.6 gigahertz. However, Ooh. if you're doing a large build and it's distributing it across all of the cores, mm-hmm. each core will stay steady at 2.3 gigahertz. Nope. So this thing, by default, its stock clock is quote-unquote 1.3 gigahertz, mm-hmm. but under load, it will run sustained at 2.3, 2.6 gigahertz, depending on how your core usage is working out. It does begin to ramp down if your thermals get high for an extended period of time. And that makes sense. That makes sense. It has about, it gets about 10 to 15, I actually measured it, it gets about 10 to 15 decibels louder. Mm-hmm. If you have a, a room with uh, like a computer fan already, you won't even be able to hear it. It'll get washed out. But it, if you're in an absolutely silent room, when it's under load, it'll add about 15 decibels of fan noise. And it's 
it's, it's not kind bad. of a whiny fan, but it's not sure. too bad. And the fact is, is I get I get when I was building Chromium Dev, I was getting two point three gigahertz across all four cores in this wow. tiny little itsy bitsy <laughs> box. <laughs> That's actually really impressive. I mean, if you stop and think about it. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, as you might expect, on the Iris graphics processor, the more RAM you dedicate to it, mm-hmm. slightly better it does, but it does have its limitations. Like you know, I had to turn off anti-aliasing entirely in trying oh. uh, in order to get to play. But once I turned off anti-aliasing, it was absolutely playable. Once I dropped it down to 720p, it was smooth as butter. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So it, if you're a casual gamer, I think the Iris thing isn't going to be a big deal for you. Like, here, I'll give you it. Now, remember, we're mirroring this, too, right? Yeah, so, so this, this is, is mirrored in addition to being on this little bitty fella. Just, you know, this is my my benchmark right here. Is, uh, and I can actually already tell you it, it doesn't perform quite as well as it does on the Bonobo. Just at this screen. That's, right. I'm pretty familiar with this game at this point. But... Uh, Oh, the sound's a little messed up. We've had some problems with the sound in this game. Yeah. Uh, see, with the mirroring on, you can see how it's stuttering. It's, it's lagging a little bit. Yeah. And I don't know. This sound bug has only affected this game, and I'm not sure why. So That's interesting. Uh, honestly, like that particular aspect of it probably keeps it from being my main rig. Right. So it may not be absolutely the go-to thing for, for me. a dedicated gaming thing, but it may be for you. Yeah, if you're not a huge gamer, then there's... I say outside of the gaming aspect, there's pretty much no compromises with this little machine. Hmm. Uh, here's a couple of things, too. is It's all modern mini ports, so it's like mini display port, oh, mini yeah. HDMI out. There's no Wi-Fi built in. You can It does have a mini PCI Express slot, expansion slot inside. Ooh. You could add a wireless chip, but you'd have to buy that separately. That's not a hard thing to do, though. The only thing it comes with is the i5 processor. Memory and drive, you add yourself. It's got two USB 3 ports on the back, two USB 3 ports mm-hmm. on the front, and one audio out jack that uh, I've played with very minimally. Uh, and and then it has the little fans slots right there, but I thought... So when you're buying your components, uh, say mm-hmm. like the hard drive or whatnot, mm-hmm. I assume that you would then buy them separately and then add them in yourself? Or is that an option that you can, uh, when you add them to the cart, if you do it in a single purchase from the same... Yeah, I just bought them all from Newegg, you know, cool. in one go. And yeah, uh, there you go. That works. So the way this thing... I was looking to see if I had a screwdriver around here. I think it's on the floor. The way this thing works is uh, the bottom. this bottom plate mm-hmm. is removable. It also comes with holes to mount in the monitor plate if you want. I like that. To, yeah. So this plate comes off, and all of the components are exposed right here. Your drive, Ooh. your memory, your PCI Express slot. That's very friendly, because then mm-hmm. you can immediately mm-hmm. get to work in expanding what you want and adding in what you uh, don't want or, you know, whatnot. Yeah, yeah. So, Good stuff. Um, I was going to, you know, shoot, I'd love to open the bottom for you, but I didn't grab a screwdriver ahead of time. Mm. See, have- it's undoubtedly around here so- anywhere. So yeah, I- probably. It's probably just fallen yeah, somewhere. Undoubtedly. But uh, yeah. anyways, I, I thought I'd run, uh, I was going to run some benchmarks on it, but I, I walked away realizing you're probably not buying a NUC for ultimate <laughs> right. performance. You're running benchmarks on a NUC. It's kind of like, you know, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you're buying it because you want a nice little low-cost computer. Yeah, but I would say it's it's a do-it-yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no support, right? There's no preloaded anything. Uh, but the do it is the easiest do-it-yourself you have ever seen because you just pop off this. Bottom. So my first thing is uh, XBMC or Plex. You know, I, you know, because <laughs> yeah. you know, immediately yeah. I think, ooh, my TV set. Yeah, I know? actually that's what I was trying to run. Sa- I tried to load Sabian on this thing because I thought oh, yeah? it'd make an awesome XBMC ooh, rig. Oh yeah, right. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. I, I think uh, I, um, I think it would run pretty well. Let's see if uh, let's see if I can pull it down. I, I think just as he pulls that down, I think it's a media center computer this would be nice because for the most part it's reasonably quiet certainly very space saving format uh, form and whatnot so yeah very tidy very nice and and uh, you know when you're watching a movie and the movie gets quiet you don't want to have to worry about the full fans and that's like Mm -hmm. the that's why the playstation didn't work great for me is because or the xbox for a media player because i would start to hear the sounds of the machine and they're and they're big boxes quite honestly in comparison to this especially it's like uh, come on you know so there we go. So here's a wow. here's XBMC right here. You well, you it. install that no time flat. Yeah. boom, done. And it, and it's fully open GL accelerated. It's oh, running see, great. This is this is this yeah. This is what I want for a media center computer right here. Yeah, and, and uh, I don't know if the 2D acceler I, I don't know where the 2D acceleration kicks in and the 3D acceleration right. kicks over. But all of it now being rendered through the GPU, I thought okay, maybe we'd have a temperature increase. I actually. I actually witnessed about a four degree decrease in the CPU temperature. Oh, that's the other thing. It's because this is all one big Intel package. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything works oh, in of kind course. of the way uh, the Mac experience kind of works. Nice. From the GUI uh, BIOS to all of the thermal sensors, all Very of that. Cool. It's an Intel NIC. It's, it, um, so in that regard, once you have it built, it's... It's almost Mac like in its right. In its well, and then if you add in an Intel wireless chipset. You're golden, right? I mean, there you yeah, go. Yeah, you could, yeah. And it, That'd uh, be the smart move. Uh, and um, 
you know, it's smaller than a Mac Mini too. Mm-hmm. So oh, that's yeah. really too. So yeah, there's XBMC. I'm just kind of browsing through all the available uh, different apps Seems on very the responsive XBMC. And there's the Jupiter Broadcasting app. If yeah, we should, wanted should. to install that, we could, and we then we could we see it's downloading right there. And then we could watch a little uh, Jupiter Broadcasting. That Although, would be kind of cool. Rob, you got to update our logo, man. What's going on over there? What's yeah, going on over yeah, there? Yeah, it's a little. So yeah, and uh, let's see, does he have the new, he's got to get that new last logo. Yes, yes, mm-hmm. yes, yes. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so uh, this is the Intel NUC. You can you, you can get uh, i3 versions, which are about $80 cheaper, $50 cheaper. You could, but I think you're going to be happier uh, future-proofing your box. Yeah, i5, I yeah. right? You get the core, pro- you get four processors, uh, you get the Iris 5000, which... Right. I, I am just blown away by the yeah. iOS. I, I think, yeah, I think that that's the way to go. I'd go i5. I would, you know, go ahead and get a proper size drive. Get make sure you got ample RAM, and then go ahead and begin dedicating that over to uh, that, uh, you know, and, video uh, stuff. As the chat room wanted to know, and yeah. it's a great question. This is right here the NUC power supply. It's about the size of a small laptop power supply. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's actually it's external. About it's not the bad, size of my netbook. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's very similar actually. Maybe yeah. may, maybe more laptop and it's kind of almost in between. Yeah, it's it's very small. small. It's it's cold to the touch. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make a buzz or anything like that, which is nice. Yes. Um and uh you know, overall, it, I think the biggest competitor for something like this I want to say it's the Raspberry Pi in some regards. Yeah, I think so, based both on price as far as uh, you know what you're able to do with it. Yeah. For me personally, this would either be the go-to computer for, say, a relative that just wants something no frills that you can set up for them quickly and get it done, or media center i really feel strongly about that i think for a media center this would be an absolute no-brainer and you know google's got those uh those chrome boxes now Mm -hmm. and this is competing against that too oh definitely i think the missing link that would make this a truly competitive product uh, and i'm not just saying this because they're sponsoring the segment is i think if a company like system 76 could take this and give me several build options at different price points wrap support around it and you know, ship it pre-configured and assembled. Oh, God. Imagine it's like Plex out of the box. You plug it in and you're Plexing. You yeah. plug in XBMC and you're XBMC. I think the idea is with the NUC platform is to make something that people can build off of. Um, yeah. It's very interesting. I, I think the biggest thing I'm taking away from this is we are now living in an age where you, if you take video games out of the equation, you mm-hmm. literally have a no compromising computing experience. I mean, you could run okay. Windows on this too. You it's can so run small, right? It's all Intel, so yeah. you can run any Linux distro on it. Um, it's quiet and it's extremely powerful. Like I, when I'm using this machine, mm-hmm. I never feel like it's not fast enough. And I, I just, right. I'm having a hard time wrapping my brain around this, the fact that something this size <laughs> can give me a full desktop-like experience that I, in the past, have paid you know several thousand dollars to get a machine that fast. I think Intel definitely did did. A nice job with that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And I got to give a big nod to GNOME 312. I think part of it too is the combination of GNOME 312's overall improvements that they have yeah. made. It's very uh, yeah. I've been I've been loving me some GNOME lately. I yeah. absolutely just yeah. GNOME 312 uh, is it's got a lot of performance improvements, and I think those in combinations with the adding the mm-hmm. glamour mode and making the changes to uh, to the GNOME compositor, it it was like a it was just a triple whammy that can't yes. be beat. Super impressed. Now the question is. What do I see its role? Like, what would I... Right. If I had, um, like, office people working for me, I would easily give them this computer. Oh, absolutely. If I needed a Linux rig and I didn't need gaming, I I would seriously consider this computer. Mm -hmm. Um, And at the end of the day, I think it makes an awesome, awesome studio machine because it's small, it's silent, it's low power, um, it's close to silent. And it could be great for taking in Skype and Hangouts and all that kind of right, stuff. So I, right. we're going to move it into this new studio. It'll be like all the episodes of TechSnap. Alan will be calling in on this. You know, Michael will be calling from Coda Radio wow. on this. It'll be handling all of our remote hosts. It has way more than enough horsepower for that. And it'll also give us a little headroom if we wanted to do something extra. I, I'm I'm really impressed. And you can play with the different options. Mm-hmm. Maybe you don't need that i5. Maybe you can get it down to like a three, $400 nut. You could. Yeah, you could. I think it really depends on what you're doing with it. If it's for casual usage, checking email, browsing the web, whatnot, yeah, go with the i3. And really, even, I mean, anything outside of gaming. Like, uh, tons of Chrome, True. you know, you're building yeah. packages. Like, yeah, you could do yeah. software development on a nut, and you would feel like it... Because a lot of times, when you go into i7, you get hyper-threading, and some stuff yeah. takes advantage of that, but it, you know, i5... Other times, is, you feel like you just kind of spend all that money yeah. for what? Yeah. That's true. Definitely That's could true. be. The, the one limitation, it could be a PFSense box. The one limitation is that uh, it only has a single NIC, so you'd have uh, to go, you have to go like USB 3 for the other mm-hmm. NIC. I don't know how that would work with yeah, PFSense. Yeah, it could be a little iffy, yeah. Uh, I, I also thought about, like, uh, it could be an, an external, like... Um, 
a file server at home, you know, oh, a lot of right. things you could use with it. So yeah. So anyways, we'll have links in the show notes for the tweaks that we made to make the NUC perform properly. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can check it out. If you get one, try different, uh, try different things. Try Try something that pushes it and see what you think. I think you'll be as surprised yeah. as I was. Very cool. All right, Matt. Well, that's the Linux Action Show's look at the Mac Mini Killer. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. But hey, Matt, yes. before we got out of here, I had a couple of things I wanted to follow up on. Yeah, uh, we All the time, we, uh, like if I had one meta email, it would be, hey, Chris and Matt, how can I expand my Linux knowledge to become right. more employable? How can I get more training? I want to learn some basics. I want to learn advanced administration. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a resource that is out there that uh, is, uh, they're a sponsor, disclaimer, they're a sponsor of Coda Radio, but I, oh. I thought they would be so perfect for you guys too. It's Linux Academy. And I got a chance to talk with these guys last week, and um, they have built an amazing educational course system that is self-paced. You go through there, they have like they have each section that tell you how long each section takes. They have video introductions, audio guides, course material you can download. Right. And when you get to a spot where there's a lab where you need to do something on the server, they will spin up a virtual instance for you and let you create in there. And this is specifically great because they have Amazon Web Services training too. If you want to become like an AWS developer, they will spin up an AWS interest on their uh, instance on their dime so you can learn and train on AWS and not worry about paying the AWS bill. That's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it, and they're always adding new course material. It's linuxacademy.com. They are a sponsor, not a sponsor of this show. This is right. They're, for not, coder they're not paying for this, yeah. uh, but you can get a discount. If you go to linuxacademy.com slash coders, it'll take $5 off the monthly subscription. And the reason why they do monthly is they're rolling out new courseware all the time. And that's also how they uh, afford the spin up of the uh, instant servers. They do scenarios too. Oh, really? So they'll have like a, they'll have like a scaling scenario that by the end of it, you've used several components of Linux, maybe even okay. a little bit of AWS, and you can walk away and say, yeah, I actually know how to implement something if like it gets a ton of tra- traffic from Hacker News. So wow. uh, go to linuxacademy.com slash coders and check them out. I signed up just to try it out, yeah. and I was like, oh, this is something that the community really kind of needs, and I kind of wish I would have thought of it myself, because it's... Yeah, it sounds like it's a really cool idea. They've, they've, been, they've built their own custom back-end system. Mm-hmm. They've, it's been out for a couple of years, but they, now they've really gotten to the point where they have a lot of content. I mean, they've even got job links. That's cool. Yeah. Well, they have a whole community section, so like it's wow. interesting. If you, if you browse the forums, uh, you'll see people like, hey, I just got my certification, mm-hmm. and then, hey, I just got a job, and it's just like it's a really kind of cool That's very community. cool. Yeah. So that's linuxacademy.com. If you go to linuxacademy.com slash coders, you'll uh, you'll save 20% on that monthly fee for the life of the fee of the monthly service. Sounds like a hell of an investment to me. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to update everybody on our Linux Fest Northwest after party. I know not everybody watching is going, obviously, sure. but we we have a we're we're gonna be at Linux Fest Northwest in a couple of weeks. We're going mm-hmm. Saturday and Sunday. And we okay, so here's the thing. <laughs> we have about 60 people signed up to go. Holy and we found wow. out the bus <laughs> the bus only carries uh, if you include myself nine other people wow okay so can so, we start strapping people uh, to the what? roof i think because uh, because uh, with the new studio build our funds are pretty much totally tapped mm-hmm. out and the bus isn't big enough i think what we want to do is have everybody come together at the actual official after party. Because some of the people are like, oh, I don't want to miss the after party. It's at mm-hmm. the Radio Museum. It's awesome. And I was like, yeah, it is really awesome. Sure. So what we'll do is we'll all get together as a group. We'll go over there. We'll, we'll hang out at the after party. We'll rock the... We'll do a, we'll do a Linux action after party nice. at the official Linux Fest Northwest after party, which really... Honestly, I've gone to it before. You can't really outdo the radio museum tour. Yeah. They show you some awesome stuff. They show you some Tesla coils and all kinds of really cool stuff. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. you can't really miss that. Um, and they have free beer. And at least, well, yeah, it's, it's going to be hard to beer. compete with. Yeah. Or but, beer free, anyway. You know, uh, I'm going to be up there Friday night setting up. So mm-hmm. if, if, if people are in the area and want to get dinner, let's coordinate as that gets closer. And sure. we'll be available Sunday after uh, we record a Linux action show on location as well. We're going to record go. that Sunday's last, which means it'll probably be out a little bit later than normal. But we record yeah. that Sunday's last on location, and you can join us for that. Maybe we'll be able to get, I don't know if we'll be able to get some chairs. We might block the flow. But after we get done, we'll be able to hang out with you guys too. And yeah. if you're going to make it, be sure to bring your challenge coin and your shirt, but also be sure to pick up the new official Linux Fest Northwest Ooh. 2014 sticker. We got a brand new sticker. We had it specifically designed for the event. It's a vinyl sticker. Styling. It's really nice. Very stylish. So everybody who makes it to Linux Fest Northwest is going to be able to pick up one of those bad boys as well. So I think it's going to be yeah. a great fest, and it's just a couple of weeks away. Going to want to get that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So that's our plans for the Linux Fest Northwest after party. We'd love to see you guys there. And uh, we're going to be, we're still coordinating at linuxafterparty.com. That's just the Google Plus community where we're getting all that put together. Yep, yep, yep. Matt, what would you like to point people to throughout the week? Uh, first thing would be datamation.com. Scroll down to open source and you will find me there with my latest article. And uh, in this one, I'm basically uh, examining what is going on with tech gurus inspired mm-hmm. by recent events from various uh, other folks. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we have that. You want to check that tech out. Tech gurus still don't get Linux. Who'd have thought, right? I mean, pfft. Total mind blow. Blow your mind. Total mind blow. And of course, not only that, you're, you're not staying still. You're also with me every single Tuesday right. on Linux Unplugged. Uh, we just did, a, I thought, a really fun Windows expired oh, yeah. episode, episode no, 35. Good, good episode. So uh, you can go check that. That if, you're, if, you, if you enjoy Linux Action Show, you can get more show by getting Linux Unplugged. They, you don't have to listen, but there's threads that go between you know each individual show. There's topics that kind of move back and forth. Um, and I, it's a great community discussion as well because mm-hmm. we have our virtual lug that joins us. But if maybe you're all Linuxed out, maybe folks want to watch a little game. Yeah, my uh, nephew and I are actually doing a, a Let's Play videos right now. And if you want to check those out at uh, Geek and the Gamer, all one word, on if you want to do YouTube search for it. Otherwise, we uh, can just go to the individual videos. Our latest one is actually for the game Fez, which check you've out seen this here intro. The How cool is this? <laughs> That's right, my flash is broken. Oh, flash, flash is broken. broken. That is yeah. a great intro. Yeah, it was, uh, I was. I did some shopping around for that one because I wasn't really, nice. uh, really wasn't liking what I had for other yeah. ones, but I like that one pretty good. So, Thanks, man, you yeah. polished it up. Polished so, it up. Uh, Fez with Geek and the Gamer, and you know, Let's Plays are blowing up, and it's yep. a great way to kind of get an idea of what a game is before you make the purchase. And too. everything, everything, the entire podcasting experience, including the games, everything's done on Linux. The whole, nice, the dude. whole thing. So go check that out. Subscribe, like, all that good stuff. So <laughs> even yeah. if a little wine has to be used from time to time, the job. I've gets been done known on to wine it. Yeah, but yeah. but yeah. you. It's on, a, it's on a Linux box. It still counts. We teased it earlier in the show, but we are curious. What is your favorite password manager? We'll have it linked in the show notes. And if you'd like us to do a roundup of password managers and review them, then please go vote. We'll be not only gauging your interest based on the votes, but actually how many of you vote. If we don't get a very good turnout on the voting, we'll assume it's not a popular topic. So if you want to go directly to it, it's strawpoll.me, and it's slash 1493451, but I'll just have it linked maybe even embedded in the show notes. Go over there and vote. My personal favorite's LastPass, but I know everybody has their choice. Uh, let's see, right now LastPass is totally winning. Ho, ho, ho. So we got 77 votes. And if that number goes up dramatically, I'll figure you guys are interested and we should do a roundup. And if it doesn't go up that much, we'll just skip the topic. So uh, a couple last bits of business before we get out of here. We'd love to get your guys' <laughs> feedback. Go over yes. to jupiterbroadcasting.com. And then if you click on that there, not the calendar link, although oh, calendar. if I'm going to click on the calendar, I should probably mention this. Oh, yeah. Jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. We try to keep that up to date with all our live events that are going on. And it automatically adjusts to your time zone. And you can subscribe via RSS and put it in your own calendar. But if you'd like to give us feedback, like I was starting ah. to say, click on that contact link. Put your name info in there. Uh, and, you know, maybe you can. You don't have to use your actual name either. You could use your IRC handle or your sure. Reddit handle or your Jeep, whatever we might know you by. Choose the show you want to reach out to and then send in your message. And then our robots diligently send it to the correct location. So you can go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact or just click the contact link at the top of any page. We'd love to hear from you. And then last but not least, don't forget, we are live Sundays, 10 a.m. Pacific at jblive.tv. You can hang out in our awesome chat room. We do a lot of stuff. Yep. Even when we go off air, there's a lot of stuff that happens. <laughs> a lot of stuff goes yeah. on. Yeah. So uh, we'd love to have you join us for that because it's even more show. And we also have an audio only stream, jblive.info, if you'd like that. Thanks. Very cool. nice. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. Bad idea. Bad idea. Bad call. Bad call. Bad call. Bad call. Bad call. Made it. Oh, man. My allergies are killing me there. Uh, your allergies starting I, to fire yeah, up Oh, yet? yeah. I popped uh, two uh, was it Zyrtex or Woo! whatever, and I'm still feeling it. I'm I getting feel, that. I, got, I got the burn. Yeah, I'm getting that right now. Holy smokes. I think it's because I went outside. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Yeah. No, I'm definitely getting the burn. Feel the burn. <laughs> 
I guess we'll both be sniffling this show. <laughs> and I, I, I took meds, but, pff, you know. Well, yeah. It doesn't work. The only thing that works is Benadryl, and you don't want to see me on Benadryl because I, my head would be on the table. Should we look at uh, some studio progress pictures, Oh, Matt? my goodness. That so is off the I, chain. I was starting to talk about uh, one of the coolest things in the last 10 years of technology. Mm -hmm. and, oh, I know we're running late, but i got to tell you about this. That's cool. These, uh, so, obviously, we have big professional studio-grade lights to the right and left there, and wow. we'll have lights behind us. And then in the middle of the ceiling are these... Hughes Philip LED lights. Oh man, these lights first of all can do like a million different colors. Mm -hmm. uh, you configure them with an app on your phone, and you just choose the color of the scene you want them to replicate. You can even import a picture and have it extract the primary colors from that picture, and then the lights wow. will represent that. So it'll, wow. it'll add it'll add texture to our backgrounds, our you know our green screens because that the light uh, the the color from the green screen will be also projected oh, onto God. us. Um, that's right. The other thing that's absolutely amazing is they have an API available to them, and they also up on GitHub have a Python library where you can you can set up an HTTP server, and you could have it pull in like JSON feeds, hmm. and you could have it do all these all of these different commands. Like you could write you could write a web interface to control the lights. You could have it go off a schedule using yeah. a JSON feed. You can have you can just send basic commands to it. So I'm thinking. There's a hallway cool. leading up to the studio, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and there's a light in oh, that. Oh, I and see I, where you're going with this. We could have the lights in that studio, in that hallway light, turn red during show times. Oh, God, that's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> How do you do a barrel roll? What's the key combo? Oh, why am I doing this again? It's too early in the morning for this crap. Oh. Yeah. So uh, that would be cool. that's the uh, that back wall is the soundproofing wall that uh, Ick in the chat room helped yeah. me with there, and uh, we got that all put up uh, over the last week. There's another angle of it, and you can see it kind of curves at the top to help a little bit with sound refraction. Very nice. Uh, and there's the side wall. So this would be to my side where mm. I'd be sitting. This is the side wall, and you can see there's the chair a little bit. Now the green screen is going to be somewhere in there. So we yeah, won't... I think I can see it on the left. There. Well, that's the, we're going to oh, that's the that. other. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. that's just sound oh, that's behind sound the green screen. Okay, yeah, okay. And then that's the wall that'd be sort of to your side right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Not for gaming or for hungry. Well, I mean, you could like I I I played trying. You know, I totally did play Trine on yeah. it once I lowered it. I turned off any and put it to 720p. Race the Sun works, but I don't think it's working right now because I'm mirroring, so it's mm. a little extra push that it just... Right, right. It's close. I wonder, like, if Intel revs, like, maybe if they have the Iris 5500 down the road or something like that. That, that could be. Maybe that'll be the sheet pad. I should have mentioned this. It does have IR built in, so that would, nice. again, make it a good XBMC contender. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It does not have Wi-Fi built in. Does not. Does not. Does yeah. not. Um, okay. Oh, oh, oh. But see, this is where I go back to, like, if System76, like, you, if they had a NUC right. configurator, you could add Wi-Fi, you could choose your different stuff, and then they assembled it and shipped it. That would be great, especially if you can, like, can say, like, look, I don't want all the extra stuff. I just want to get, you know, XBMC or mm -hmm. Plex or whatever it is. I, I know I'm really stuck on that Media Center thing. I just think it'd be great. Oh, very, very cool. Yeah, yeah. So there's a screenshot of the new Ubuntu Touch app uh, wow. for uh, Linux Action Show. You can see there's Linux Unplugged. And, I like the way that's yeah, laid out. And it That's... does video as well. And what oh. is cool about this, right, is... This will also work on the desktop, and he's already oh, wow. he's already designed it. So if you if you scroll yeah. it out for a desktop resolution, the UI. Oh, that's great. Yep, that's, that's that's I approve. It's a, the uh, Jupiter Broadcasting Ubuntu Touch app is a convergence app. In my opinion, the single best, and I think I've probably said this before, so correct me if I have. Single best marital aid in the world, and I don't mean that in a weird, creepy sense, <laughs> is uh, Nerf guns. I am telling you, get into an argument, bust a cap in each other. That's You'll feel better idea. in 10 minutes. I'm serious. I we, can see it. We've stemmed so many screaming matches using those things. It's been great. Ah, uh, yes, Matt. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs>